Good evening. Welcome uh, and thank you for joining us for the launch of this year's City Lit Between the Lines Anthology, featuring work from across the breadth of our writing courses. The anthology contains everything from poetry to prose, script writing to memoir, short story to novel writing. My name is Ian Tucknott and I'm Head of School for Humanities and Sciences and it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's event. It's hard to believe that it was just over a year ago that we launched our 2019 anthology in what was City Lit's centenary year. And that anthology explored the themes of history and memory, time and temporality, and our human and creative experiences and responses. This was a wonderful contribution to the work we did as part of our centenary at City Lit exploring our history and learning about our legacy, particularly at significant times in history, such as the Second World War, and through times of social and political change. Little did we realize that what was just around the corner and what 2020 would have in store for us and the challenges we would encounter. What we have learned and done though is what we have done throughout our history. We've worked together and adapted and continue to teach to learn and to create, and persisted in our purpose of bringing people together to enrich lives through learning. This year is an equally and perhaps more important and interesting anthology because we are living through an important and interesting time. I truly feel that the past year has been a significant one for writing and for creativity on the whole, and the anthology reflects how significant these things are for us all. I'm sure I'm not alone in noticing how this year's events have affirmed more than ever the major role words, language, and the thinking that they generate play in our lives, and the understanding, solace, and inspiration they can provide. When we first went into lockdown, my instinct took me directly to poetry, and it has been words that have helped me personally through this time. We have been reminded, if we ever needed it, how writing provides a space for reflection, introspection, and expression. How it can help us grapple with challenges we face, bringing unique and fresh insight. How it can connect us and bring us together, reminding us of our shared humanity and our ability to empathize. How it can challenge as well as comfort, surprise us as well as bring us joy. Whether as writers, readers, or listeners, we must celebrate the power of words as one of the greatest tools we have to not only survive, but to connect, to empathize, to love, and to thrive. Without further ado, I shall now hand over to our compare for this evening, Maria Thomas, who will be introducing each of our incredible and talented speakers. May I wish you all an enjoyable evening of words and language. Thank you, Ian. I'm very pleased to welcome Paul Mardling, kicking off our readings for this evening. Thank you. I remember dreaming spires. I remember dreaming spires. Do I eck? Reunions and gowns and port and porters. Upsailing from rooftops onto manicured lawns. And weather sprunes and blackouts and bruises post boxes on misty days and dreams of youth on cold winter's evenings and vinyl and arrogance and self-confidence, astronomy and bikes and sheds and locks that wouldn't stop anyone or anything. I remember when a mile was a million and we walked across that strange exile to concrete and glass and rubbish parties filled with engineers and cheap lager. I remember water and weirs and meadows and picnics and fear and loathing and bosons and quarks and Schrodinger, never quite belonging there. And blessed relief that I wasn't the only one. And then you. Yes, you. You somehow got even there with hospitals and scans and laughter and crunching gears and beer and lunches and football and tears, traffic jams and broken rules. And now, now knowing it's all no more. I remember mists and summertime, rowing boats and rivers, 
and so many lost words that come back to me now as old friends and wise youth and you, you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And now I'm thrilled to welcome Narin Betjeman. Sorry, I'm having a bit of trouble with the video here. There we go, sorry about that. I don't know why the technology is doing that. I'm going to read a very short piece called Clarissa, Ginger and Clarissa. The credits rolled down the TV screen. Ginger had slept through most of the program. In the bathroom, he changed into his pajamas. He squeezed a length of toothpaste onto his electric toothbrush and smiled at himself in the mirror. He might not be Ginger anymore, but he had a good set of teeth. Look after your, your gums and they will look after your teeth, his dentist always said. After three minutes, the toothbrush stilled and he replaced it next to Clarissa's bottle of Chanel number no. five. With each year since she'd passed the, passed, the perfume had increased in color and decreased in quantity. Somehow something similar had happened to his memories of their time together. For some reason, it, what was most vivid wasn't what they had done, but what they hadn't. Peru was on his mind a lot lately, even in his dreams. They'd been determined to go to Machu Picchu. They'd made plans. She'd bought guidebooks and identified the best time of year to go. He'd costed flights. Somehow it had never happened. He couldn't remember what had stopped them, but something had. He went to their bed and pulled back the duvet. Perhaps tonight he and Clarissa would visit Peru together. Thank you. Thank you, Naren. And now I'm very happy to welcome Alka Handa. Hi, thanks Maria. Um, hi everyone. I uh, wrote this short poem during lockdown, uh, the first lockdown in the spring. It's called The Chiming Sea. Locked in my mind, I wander alone through springtime woods of shade and light, shielded by ancient pillars of green, solitary stalwarts in an impending storm. As I stumble forward in the uncertain light, shifting winds try to steer my course, a swathe of purple haze bending in flight, beguiling, soothing, my senses fill with delight. Like a boat at sea, I glide over gentle waves of drooping bells, echoing with an eerie silence. As the world grows strange and distant, I know the bluebells will return again. Thank you. Thank you, Alka. And now I'm very pleased to welcome Zoe Branson. Hi everyone. I'm reading from a longer piece that's called Nettles. The city is crawling. It never stops. To be still is to become invisible. Strangers flood across the bridge. From my plinth space on the embankment, I watch them surge. Endless figures, hell-bent on speed, moving painfully slow. I'm to have my portrait taken for Vanity Fair. A big deal. It's early and I'm impatient. So I pause a while by the river. In my hand is a pamphlet a guide to an artist whose work I admire. They're different to me, 
At odds, you could say, I thought it would be amusing to hold their portrait in my own. I've always liked to court controversy in the slightest of ways. Slipped inside the pamphlet is a postcard on it, a self-effacing portrait of a man. It's hard to say what age he is, not young, maybe close to my age now. He wears a hat, a fedora with a striped band around it, glasses too thick and black rimmed. He's a poet, but he's a junkie. Perhaps the fact he's a junkie makes him a better poet. I can't linger on him too long or else his lips begin to move in an indecipherable staccato. There were words scratched on the back from my brother. The last I heard, a sphinx I think of him, absence or abscess, a gap through which quiet memories flit, easy as summer careless butterflies. A tall figure cuts across the Malay. She moves with the upright self-possession that made my school friend distinct. And I feel my heart quicken along with my pace. Sharp scent of melon, then cinnamon donuts, the smell of childhood. I follow her, a papery wind snapping at my ankles. I knot at tourists in goose down coats Voluminous as inflated life jackets parachute across my view. If only I were taller, same thought then and now. I crane around the group, knowing that she's lost, vanished, nowhere to be seen. There was never anything certain about Lux. She's mercurial. That's what made her irresistible and fatally flawed. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Zoe. And now I'm very pleased to welcome Gavin Ramsey. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I took part in the One Day Haiku course, which I can uh, wholeheartedly recommend <laughs> if anyone's interested so um here goes bonfire toffee Ooh, a sky full of color ah uh, it does not last long bonfire toffee Ooh, a sky full of color ah uh, it does not last long thank you Thank you, Gavin. Short but very, very sweet there. I am thrilled now to welcome Polly Bull. Good evening. My poem is Scratchy Outsider. Oh, you perplexing hedgehog. I love you like sand between toes and in ears after all day beach. Rough like cracked heels, but adorable. My darling sandpaper planet, orbiting the fruit bowl. Because I have no idea what to do with you. You are a lonely hut on the Yorkshire moors. Hard to reach, but a novel inside. Dearest coconut, sometimes you're Britain. Sometimes you are as Californian as a lifeguard tower advising fragrant banana boat sunscreen on an already burnt face. So different outside from in. Solid wood filled with waves. I shake you and I'm diving into the sea. Offering freedom, you're somehow also unyielding. My knee aches still, scraped up from that fall on brown beams. And I know you could hurt me just the same. But love... You are deceptively sensitive, born of sun, dryness and hydration, the very best contradiction. Pretending to be impenetrable, you are life itself. I envy your protective uniform. I am inside out. You are too wise to make that mistake. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you, Polly. And now I'm very pleased to welcome Karina Bidler. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Maria. I'm going to read um, a quite short poem which came out of a sonnet writing workshop. It was just a single day workshop run by Sarah Wardle in February. And the poem came out of the workshop in two ways. First of all, because it was um, my response on the day to an invitation to write a loose or ghost sonnet. So, so it's very loosely around the traditional sonic form. And secondly, it sprang directly from meeting somebody in that workshop I hadn't seen for years. And looking back on it now, it does feel quite poignant because mid-February, central London, we did not have a clue what was coming our way. It's called Old Timers. We haven't seen each other in years. Last time, you brought me pastries. I clapped enthusiastically at your reading. You say I'm looking younger. It's true, I've had blonde plastered over the gray. At lunchtime, we dig to unearth the gem at the heart of this, find it in a joke about never quite getting what we want. You sing me some of your lyrics. I can't hear, but catch your meaning in your earnest face. You say kindly, someone is ogling me, and we agree, we're both getting old. Find traveling into town exhausting. Acknowledge maybe the best has gone by. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. And now I'm very pleased to welcome Michael Climes. Even, evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm going to read uh, two short poems. The first is called Five Senses of Depression. I'm the click click of the kill squad, the cackle of hyenas, the clang of the church bell. I'm the uppercut you do not see. I'm for coffin corners that shut all horizons. I bring bleach to blister nostrils, the inhale of gas, the reek of personal neglect. I curdle all the milk, put pepper on ice cream, pour salt into tea. I'm the back itch you, can, you cannot reach, the leg cramp you cannot stop, the migraine that never leaves. This second poem is, is called Meeting Father. Winter submerges Prague in layers of snow. I see father walk here 50 years ago. Down this very road, my head turns to look into a shop window. I meet father my age still alive. We say nothing and confront each other. My nose glides closer to his and everything blurs as my breath vaporizes him and we merge. He always said, you remind me so much of myself. I stand still on this. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And now I'm thrilled to welcome Lauren Farmer. I'll be reading an extract from a novel that I'm working on called On Loan. We've already ordered wine. Katie points enthusiastically towards the ice buckets. Figured getting four bottles was cheaper than all just ordering glasses, Katie says. My shoulders drop. I bet that was her idea. Oh, yeah, no worries. How is everyone? I reply. Good, good, we're starving, Annie says. The waiter appears again, handing me a menu, and places down the table bread and olives they must have ordered before I arrived. I recommend three to four dishes per person, but of course sharing, so you get to try a bit of everything, he says. My eyes dart around the Italian tapas menu, the truffle tagliatelle, duck ragu and sea bream way down the page, oozing richness and indulgence. I only had a bowl of muesli for breakfast, but the familiar clump of uneasing my stomach squashes any hunger. Eight pound for one dish, 10 pound for the meat ones, another 15 pound for the table bread and olives. Wine is 25 pound a bottle, that's another 20 pound each. Maybe if I chose the cheapest dishes, it would bring the bill down, even by just a little bit. Licking their lips as their fingers carefully work their way down the menu. My friends taking each dish, making ooh and mmm noises in anticipation of what's to come. Katie impatiently puts her menu down. 
I think to stop ordering too much of the same thing, we should order as a group. Maybe if we get one of everything on the menu. Katie looks around the group. What do you reckon? Everyone nods, clearly happy someone has made the collective decision. Then they all put the menu down and begin talking. Smoothly, effortlessly. Instead, I'm doing the maths. The £57.63 in my bank account won't cover this. I excuse myself to go to the toilet. Hold on, I'll come with you, Katie says, instantly getting up to join me. Shit. In the cubicle, I sit on the closed lid of the toilet seat. Like a sand timer, I hear Katie peeing. My hands shake as I open the app Paypanda. Welcome back, Brittany. No paperwork, no obligation, no fees, the homepage reads. I tap £100, selecting other as the reason for the loan. My thumb hovers over the confirm button. Katie finishes peeing. I have no other options. Approved. Just like that. A bitter exhilaration runs through me. I now owe £800, 59.9% APR. I flush the toilet. This has to be the last time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. And now I'm thrilled to wel welcome Alex Morrill. So this is a poem called Antidote. Leslie gives you the syringe. This is the antidote to ghosts. So you look the other way as she injects its synthetic yellow fluid. You take the pinch, you wince. You try not to ponder the nauseating realities of your charging circulatory system. And when done, and when sunk in and rinsed round, you lie back deep breathing. You smell the clear air open up like a flower and thank your life and wait until the ghosts heaping up against the door force it open all over again. Thank you very much, Alex. And now I'm happy to welcome Neil Douglas. Okay, H hello everyone. Um, I have a poem called uh, Rudy. Rudy used to be a Brighton rocker. Now he's twisting with the blues. Benignly troubled prostate proud quiff of sparse grey hairs, his hips, his knees are shot to bits and pieces, can't tie his bleeding laces, got velcro on suede shoes, zimmers down the corridor, still bopping to a tune, tumbles down the greasy stairs, a what bop a lula, a what bam boom. Thank you. Right, this is um, a short flash fiction piece um, from Character and Focus, and just a, a photograph on the, the wall, and we just had to write character on it, and this is what came out. Cheese and chips. Jake smiled at the gathered crowd. He went through all the usual pleasantries. Okay, we'll say cheese, cheese and chips, cheese and chips, that's right, little ones in the front, dad you kneel down, holding the baby, that's it, and lovely. A grandmother smoothed out her lilac dress. The best man awkwardly adjusted his new nylon tie. The bride's white gown billowed out in a sudden warm gust of wind, but as Jake turned his camera on it, suddenly the focus zoomed right in as if on its own out of control of his fingers now all he could see for the viewer was white. White dominated the screen like his loneliness, threatening to take over. Oh no, it's not going faulty on me, is it? He thought. And then the gold wedding band on his own middle finger started feeling itchy and sticky for some reason and he wanted to take it off. What's going on? What's going on? Sorry folks, wait a mo. He tried to fiddle with the lens but now his hands had left the black surface all wet. Oh, hold on, I want to get this fixed, he fumbled. The bride's dress continued to gently lift, swell and swing in the breeze before him, with her laughing as she tried to hold that down with one hand, the other wobbling unsteady as it tried to balance under its huge weight of flowers. Jake felt his breath stiffen, and the discomfort with the ring was obstructing all his thought. You just readjust the millimeter focus and aperture back into F16. But come on, I can't readjust it, he fretted as once again his hand slipped. I'm going nowhere. The child started moaning about when he could have cake. Not now, be still, we can have it later, his mother replied firmly. Jake's phone bleeped, a text from his wife. 
She knew he'd be working, but it was important this time. He told her, just text yes if positive, no if negative, then I'll know for the rest of the day and get on. He glanced at it quickly. His breath tightened, but it was a no. Trying for so long, and a run of tears at dinner tonight again from her, of course, tears tonight, but as if that old movie cam had already quietly begun. His hands were still hot, but at least now I felt dry with a relief, and he didn't mind if his own old dampening jowly face had to take it as long as he could work. Nobody saw the photographer. He blinked back on the slight blur, only that great big bouquet now needing to wobble back into focus, and then all would be all right, firm, clear. Then hold it, sharpen on the rest, good. Yep, right on that gown there, beautiful. All right, you folks, I'm ready. Cheese and chips, please. Cheese and chips. Thanks very much, Piala. And now I'm thrilled to welcome Ansia Patel. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Good evening. I remember that Monday. I remember that Monday morning on the number nine bus. His warm eyes smiling on my iPhone. I'm having a stroke. The ambulance is here. I froze like the traffic, my mind tussling back and forth like the angry wind. I don't remember how my feet carried me that day. He in his raw blue pyjamas poured hot water into a mug. A nurse on each side kept watch, water flowing onto the floor. I remember that smell of hospitals as I walked in and said hello. He looked through me, walked past without a word. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ansia. And now I'm thrilled to welcome Sophie Bird. Hello, thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Maria. Uh, my poem is called Tamazapam. Lying awake, fatigue begged for sleep like an orgasm. So close. The day replayed in irregular heartbeats and the sleeping body next to fatigue dreamt on unaware of the non-sleeper writhing silently beside them. The day ended earlier than usual for fatigue. Teeth brushed, face washed, and irreligiously prayed to God, any God, all the gods for rest. 9pm was an unusual bedfellow against their older siblings of three and four, and insomnia put the kettle on with a smile on her lips. The stress of not sleeping is as bad as a forgotten alarm. You hate yourself for being awake when you could be asleep. You hate your lack of dreams, the almost tears, childlike against the full time of your adult eyes. Scratch, let me sleep, in biro onto your forearm. The forest fires begin and you're restless. The week becomes a schedule of sleep and no sleep, I'll lie in the day after tomorrow, but tomorrow is an unreachable state of being. It's always today. May as well say I'll sleep when the cock crows midnight. Fatigue looks at her clock. Insomnia pulls the hours off night like a daisy and forgets to kiss her children goodnight. Fatigue hears the witches playing in the street through her earplugs, but rolls her head under her pillow, counts backwards from 100. A decade ago, sleep came easily and stayed long. Fatigue went by a different name. Insomnia didn't press her knuckles into fatigue's eyes. There's no rest for the wicked. And fatigue wonders what she did to deserve the endless scaffolding that keeps her awake. Fickle dreams pile up their calling cards and eventually stop trying. She doesn't want to play with us, they matter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sophie. And now I'm thrilled to welcome Susan Carberry. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming to this reading this evening. My name is Susan, and I'm going to read my poem, All Seasons. Winter's skeletal fingers curl around naked trees, 
turning them white, smothering their lifeblood with frost and snow. Cold strangled earth lies in pools of frozen time. Thawing at spring's renaissance, heralded by snowdrops, crocuses, daffodils, a profusion of colour following months of monochrome. Summer breezes in, bursting buds with warm sunshine, heating ponds effervescing with life, optimism, joie de vivre. Autumn arrives, its palpable chill lays summer to rest. Opaque mists envelop decaying landscapes. Dying leaves flutter groundwards, exposing the trees to winter's skeletal fingers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. And now I'm very pleased to welcome Thordis Thorsteins. Thank you and hello everyone. I am going to be reading a short story that's called Hunted by Home. Are you a citizen here? The border guard asks. You contemplate giving him the fabricated story you prepared before making this journey. No, you admit. Until recently, it didn't seem to matter where you were born. It mattered that you have lived and worked here for four years. Not that this is too short to qualify for citizenship. Your idea of home is now irrelevant, next to the proudly stated country on your passport. The guard shirt had clearly not been ironed this morning. A half-eaten apple by his side is starting to turn brown. The long line of people behind you suggests that he won't get a chance to finish that apple for a while. You're sure he's had multiple conversations like this one. Everyone wants to be at home during these times. But what does home mean? You and him don't seem to agree. To him, it matters that you and your partner, who is a citizen, decided the marriage wasn't for you. To you, it matters that your most cherished items that make a flat into a home are here. The red wool jumper that your partner brought back from Lapland, the one you've almost worn out, but it's still your first choice protection from cold autumn evenings. The handwritten apple pie recipe prepared by your grandmother that you know off by heart, but still read every time. You've been here long enough to know your way home from almost any district north of the river. You know where to get the best Sunday roast and which routes to avoid in the morning. But you can't prove that you haven't called your birth country home since leaving at 16. The guard types something on his keyboard and looks at his screen. His glasses reflect, March, no exceptions. A family crosses the border marking and heads for baggage reclaim. They're bickering about whether to eat here or at home. The guard points towards a line of people by the security sign. Like you, none of them holds a burgundy passport. Please join the queue over there. Thank you. Thank you, Thordis. And now please join me in welcoming Kate Richards. Thank you, Maria. I'm, um, and good evening to everybody. I'm going to read a, a, a short piece called Name Tapes, which is a scene from my memoir. It sticks to last night's veneer of chip fat and sugary rings of iron brew on the Formica. Cupping my hands around the eye heart Nessie mug, I watch the chuckling, clucking purple rinses, bobbing around a teapot on the table opposite, Quilted coats and nylon choppers in a tumble on the floor. On the walls, photographs of the Cairngorms in Loch Morlich, their laminated cor corners curling, chart the meanderings of a local artist. 
I remember mum had bought neem tapes for my school uniform, sewing them into my purple blazer, skirt and jumper. Even the regulation socks and gym pants had to be identified with Kate Richards in Time's New Roman. A year ago, I'd ordered 50 name tapes and taken them to Dad's cottage, where although the spiders had spun cobwebs over the ash in the grate, the acrid smell of peat smoke still lingered. The sewing tin with the blue cows on the front, I remembered from childhood, the hinges rusted, was in a drawer beside his pipe. I'd sewn the white labels onto his socks, pyjamas and checked shirts, stitching round the edges at first, then just enough to anchor each end. My fingers punctured and dotting blood, blood eyes watering as smoke blew back down the blocked chimney. The residents should have finished breakfast by now, I thought, taking my Nessie mug to the till. The girls' shellac nails tapping the keys like seagulls' feet on a car roof. Dad was in one of the blue, white, clean armchairs in the sitting room, in Nike track suit bottoms and sweatshirt I didn't recognise. His favourite shirts with buttons, too time consuming for the staff who now dressed him in easy care. Shall we sit in the garden? I've brought your straw hat. He looked up, a drooping tulip revived by water, revealing a new gap in his teeth as he pulled back his lips. Holding his arm as he slippered along the lino, I didn't need to shield my fingers as I keyed in the code for the door. His hand on my shoulder, I pointed out bird's foot trefoil, the colour of custard and purple mountain pansies, plants he taught me to identify as a child. On the bench under the larch, he tilted his face to the sun, the wrinkles around his eyes softening as his hand groped for mine. Can I take a photo? Dad opened an eye. Kneeling, I held up my phone, leaning forward to frame his head. His eyes seemed sunken, shriveled, his cheeks dappled by the sun under the perforated brim of his straw hat. There's a navy ribbon around the brim and attached to the ribbon is a white name tape, spotted with blood and anchored at each end. His name, Tony Richards, embroidered in Time's New Roman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. And now I'm thrilled to welcome Roberta Francis. I am um, going to read from an extract from a, uh, my novel called Changing Rooms. I woke up, I was shivering and the quilt was gone. I felt something damp against my face and I could smell piss. I shuffled and opening my eyes saw a lump wearing a black coat. My back felt so sore and so bloody stiff. I rubbed my spine and tried to curl up in a ball, but the smell made me restless. The lump beside me moved and dragged itself up. Slowly, reluctantly, I pulled myself up too and stared. Oh, Jesus, as I said. It was Mumbles, the man with grey-blue eyes. Eyes that looked so like Ma's. Blazing eyes that sat above an enormous white beard. It was Mumbles, all right. The bloke I'd seen eating white pudding outside O'Brien's Butchers in Taylor Street. The man with dirty brown teeth. Get out me bed, he growled. You a bed? This is our den, I said, pointing at myself. For a moment I thought about Sean. You and who, he asked. I just kept staring. Mumbles was such a ring off her Uncle Paddy. The hair was longer though, and so was the beard. Both were matted like one of those Rastafarian lads I'd watched on the old grey whistle test. I looked him up and down. His belly wasn't as round. He definitely lost weight. But I thought he'd still be staying at a homeless hostel in town. That's what Aunt Nola said. To kick you out Bright Street, I asked boldly. The man hesitated and made a strange grunting noise. He fell back in the mattress, then hit the wooden panels behind him. For a moment, I felt sorry for him, but then I thought about Ma. I looked around the den and the floor was covered in empty Guinness bottles. On the panel opposite, an old pair of grey slacks hung from a nail. The slacks were crumpled and had a belt and a sil and silver buckle. Next to them, a striped orange short hung from another nail, and as I scanned the floor again, I saw the bell, just like the one Uncle Paddy used to ring. I moved my right leg towards the bell, pointing at it with my foot. Now, now, mum's the word, he said, and he watched. 
mumbles pushed his hands into the pockets of his muddy coat. Was he looking for a stash? Just the way the way I did when I had stuff. I started la- laughing, but then I got angry. This is Uncle Paddy. I wish to God he'd go back. Poor man was up the wall, but would he? I hope it's not fish fingers I'm looking for, I said. He twisted awkwardly like he was wearing a straight jacket. Then he took out the nagging bottle and screwed the crack cap and clearing his throat, spat. Lifting the bottle, he swallowed the whiskey in one gulp. That, that made me feel sick. We out all night, he said, twitching his head and wiping whiskey from his beard. No, I got lost, I said, as the branches outside rattled and scratched the rusty tin roof. I shuddered. Lost? Will a man not be worried, he said. I looked at those swift gray, blue grey eyes of his, soft blue grey eyes of his. Well, son, you know yourself. Would you not go back to Aunt Newley? Ah, now, don't mention the war. He turned his head away and his hand started to slap on the back of his head. That made me laugh, but only for a second. Does she agitate you? Ma Baker, I said. Dublin's not safe, you know, for your kind, he said. What kind? I said. And, and a boat whistled in the distance. Ah, he moaned. The Abbey Theatre kind, of course. All dressed up in top hats and pails, wigs and coats. He stopped and stared at me for a minute. Twitching. I twitched back nervously. In Voyage Dance, I met your sword in the Navy. Portsmouth, Maddock, Hesh, the Iron Islands. He stretched his neck and stood up, then leaping towards the dolly road. She's all mouth! He started to shake. His arm stuck out either side of him like a scarecrow. He coughed and his whole body seemed to go into convulsions. I was scared, but I didn't move. Leaning over me, he started searching through his bag. He rolled towards the door and pushed against it with his shoulder. We looked through the park. At the figures walking slowly, a gang of hooded shadows bouncing around the wide open space were looking our way. They all had their hoods up. Uncle Paddy looked at me. Look, he said, we'd better. No bollocks, any of them, he shouted and closed the door. Have you any grub, he asked. No. Move over then, give an elf with some room. As he, as he leaned gently to his side and made some space, outside the sun tried hard to break through the dark clouds and he rustled around in his bag. And took off his cap and produced a big cube of silver paper. I got this lot, this lot, and the little flower on Maid Street. Do you know it? I'm from Fairview, I said. That's it. Thank you. Hello, man. That's me. Thanks, Roberta. I just finished there because it was over three minutes, you know. That's fine. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to welcome Carol Mishk. Hello. Hello. I'm going to read two short poems to you. Reckoning. I once saw a parrot fall to the ground mid-flight like a stone. A gaudy pin-eyed Icarus, he lay immobile as gingerly I lifted him, the weight of a loaf in my palm. I set his sleek body in the midst of a thicket, knowing that later, like a suitor, the fox would creep, red ravaging green, and in the morning a feather or two strewn in the undergrowth. A feather for a body eaten whole, an offering this test of journeying on. My second poem is called Brief Encounters. Today, I flattened a moth between two love poems, thinking of my favorite jumper. I lifted a spider, cartoon legs scaling the cliff of my coat, offering a branch for her tightrope dance. I planned a mouse cull in the kitchen. Touched by the transience of a dead dragonfly, I wept as Mimi died in La Boheme, dismissed a straggly pigeon whose swivel eyes sought mine, then mosaic to snail underfoot, flesh as grout. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And now our final reader of the evening, I'm thrilled to welcome Sarah Hall. Hello everyone, 
Um, I'm going to read a short story called How Did It Happen? How did it happen? He tucks the rug round your legs and props your stick against the side of the recliner chair. You notice thick streaks of grey in his hair. He stoops as he moves to the door. How did it happen? It's so gradual you didn't notice. You remember his tiny prune-like face when they put him in your arms in the hospital, the overwhelming rush of love. You'd kill to keep him safe. Another memory, a summer walk to school, his satchel strap too long, the bulky bag slapping against his bare legs. He slips his small hand in yours. You squeeze it. You leave him at the gate. He sneaks a look back. It breaks your heart. Fast forward, he's big and strong, tanned from a summer spent island hopping with his friends. He puts his hand on your shoulder. He tries to comfort you. It had to happen, he says. I won't be far. I'll be back at weekends. And you can call me any time. But you know it's over. He has his own life now. You reach out your hand. He has his back to you and doesn't notice. Dust motes dance in the sun. He bends over a box of books. He grunts as he carries it through the door. He's gone. A smart man in a business suit. Can this be your son? He smiles for the camera. He speaks with assurance into the microphone. People listen to him and ask him questions. You must be so proud, they say to you. He doesn't look at you in the corner. Afterwards, you take a drink from a tray. You pretend you're not there. He speaks to a woman who smiles at him a lot. She puts her hand on his arm. She throws her head back and flashes her white teeth. Meet Pearl, he says some months later. Pearl takes your hand. Hers is small and dry. She doesn't look at you. He moves to London and then New York. You see him on TV. Pearl stands beside him. She doesn't look at the camera. He sends you letters and cards. Then they stop. He sends you emails and texts, but you don't know how to use the iPad he gives you. You have to move with the times, he says. You don't tell him it's hard. He sends you pictures of the christenings and birthday parties. They look so like him, not like Pearl at all. Pearl looks sad in the pictures. You don't feel victorious. A phone call, he's coming home. Pearl isn't. You rarely see the children, they live with their mother. You rarely see him. He lives in a big house in a gated community. He says he's happy, he won't meet your gaze. Your flat feels too big, the cat dies. You slip getting out of the bath. You press the panic button and he calls an ambulance. It's for the best, he says. You're not so sure. The days are long. The residents aren't friendly. They look right through you. He rarely visits. He says he cares. You're not so sure. You look at your gnarled, knotted hands. You look at the lines around his tired eyes. How did it happen? Thank you. Wow, that was incredible. Um, thank you to all of our speakers for sharing their words and their writing this evening. And I hope that all of our audience out there have enjoyed it as much as I have. It's quite odd doing this without the applause and listening to the applause, but I hope you're all applauding at home. Um, if you've enjoyed what you've heard this evening, the full Between the Lines anthology is available to download for free from our website, uh, www.citylit. Um, dot ac dot uk slash between the lines. We'd also like to let you know that some of our writers who are unable to join us this evening have recorded their readings um, and we'll be posting these on our social media over coming weeks. Um, if you don't already, you can follow us on Twitter um, at City Lit Writing or on Facebook at City Lit Creative Writing. Finally, I'd like to give a huge thank you to our editors, Claire Allen, Helen Cox, and Maria Thomas. And also thank you to Maria for comparing this evening. I'd like to thank Jackson Ariado for his design, editing, and coordination, Cattell Pinchon for project management, um, and also Sam Bunker for her technical support this evening. Perhaps more importantly, I'd like to thank our talented, inspiring, and hardworking teachers for continuing to work their magic over the past two terms and of demonstrating that online learning can be as good as that which takes place face to face. And of course, my biggest thanks is to all of our writers uh, who choose to learn with us and have continued to learn with us through this challenging year. 
Of course, if anyone out there has been inspired by our writers this evening and are interested in discovering or nourishing your own inner writer, then please visit www.citylit.ac.uk to explore our courses. Um, and these run from beginner to advanced um, and in whatever genre of writing you might be interested in. Two final announcements. One is uh, coming up in January, we have the deadline for applications for our Mallory Blackman Scholarship for Unheard Voices. And these are open to any of our current students and aim to support the development of underrepresented voices in writing. You should be able to find the link um, on the Between the Lines page on our website. Finally, if you've enjoyed this evening, um, we are planning to restart our uh, regular late lines spoken word events um, and we'll be running these online in the new year. So if you've enjoyed what you've heard, again, follow us on social media, keep in touch um, and hopefully you'll join us for more writing and more listening and more words in the future. Thanks to all of our speakers and readers this evening. Thanks to all of you out there who've joined us. Um, have a wonderful festive break over the next few weeks and enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thank you.